Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome you in the name of Jesus. We uh, this morning. I have a question regarding forgiveness. That's really what the what the whole thing's about. Is there someone in your life that you haven't forgiven? Do you have a relationship with somebody that that isn't what it should be because it's soured, because there's ill feelings and resentment? Are you harboring ill will or something? And this morning we want to talk a little bit about forgiveness and then perhaps you can examine these things for your own, for yourself. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, as we approach your word, as we approach your throne this morning, we're mindful of who you are. We're mindful that you've created everything and that your eyes are on us. Lord, we realize that we have shortfalls and shortcomings and that we need you. That we need you, Lord, for the wisdom of the world, for the wisdom of the spiritual world to be in our lives, that you can open our eyes and, and our hearts, that we may receive from you that which you've given us from your word. So, Lord, I pray for these in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right, so this morning we're going to look at the book of Luke. <clears throat> it's probably chronologically the one of the most accurate and uh, and the most complete. It's certainly the longest of the of the gospels. And today's message is from Luke 17, from verse 3 to verse 19. And your some of it is about the 10 lepers. This portion fits in in a in a section that is recognized as the journey. Now, the, there are about seven sections in the book of Luke, and this is in section five, which is known as the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And it starts when Jesus sets his mind on Jerusalem. And you understand that to mean that when he purposes himself, that he's going to, he's going to Jerusalem to give his life. And it starts in chapter 9, verse 51, and then it goes right through to chapter 19 and verse 28. And it's, so it's after the section, section 4, which is known as his ministry, and it's also after the, the resurrection of Lazarus, which is quite important. It's, it's before the crucifixion, which is then section 6. So, Luke 17, verse 3 to 19. Watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times returns to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this sycamine tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Would any of you say to your slave who comes in from the field after plowing or shepherding sheep, come at once and sit down for a meal? Won't the master instead say to him, get my dinner ready and make yourself ready to serve me while I eat and drink? Then you may eat and drink. He won't thank the slave because he did what he's told, will he? So you too, when you have done everything you were commanded to do, should say, we are slaves undeserving of special praise. We have only one, we have only done what was our duty. Now, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he was entering a village, ten men with leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, raised their voices, and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went along, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell with his face to the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Now this man was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to turn back and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to the man, 
Get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So let's just quickly give an overview. Certain things happen here. Jesus starts with a teaching on forgiveness in verse 3. And this is the message. It's a simple command to forgive your brother. <clears throat> it's interesting that the Greek word, aphiaimi, suggests the idea of, of letting go. So just let it go. <clears throat> In verse 4, Jesus strengthens his argument and tries to make the uh, impression that forgiveness is more important than just forgiving your brother. It's, it's even when he does more and that you don't necessarily find it comfortable anymore. And this is where it becomes challenging and this is perhaps where the, where the apostles find it very difficult. And so what they do is they ask him for faith. So the thinking is that they think they need faith to be able to forgive somebody. Jesus brings them back gently. And then he also introduces the idea that you don't get rewards for doing what you were instructed to do, what you were meant to do, and specifically in this case, to forgive. And then ten lepers appear. Now, to my mind, I think this is pretty much a, a miracle. It was arranged that way. And just, a separate, just as leprosy separates lepers from their family, sin separates us from God. In healing the leper, Lepers, Jesus demonstrates that in dying for our sins, he creates the opportunity for us to be reconciled to God. So Jesus brings back everything to forgiveness, the instruction right in the beginning. Take note that the word foreigner here is it's the only place it's used in the New Testament. So that's quite interesting. The Samaritans are not accepted by the Jews at all. They're specifically not allowed in the temple. Um, and then another thing that comes up that's quite interesting, he says to them, go and show yourself to the priest. Now in chapter 5, he did a healing of a Samaritan and he said, don't tell anybody. And now he says, go and show yourselves to the priests. So obviously his angle, once he's decided to go to Jerusalem, is, is different. And you can imagine the, the consternation that that must have caused by these nine lepers turning up at the priests and saying we've been healed <clears throat> but there's a couple of disconnects in this portion of scripture the first one is the the apostles response to the teaching of jesus jesus says you must obey your brother and then when he says even when it's seven times in a day they say we need faith there isn't really a connection between the need for faith and the need to forgive and the command to forgive rather. And then Jesus responds to their request. We need more faith. He tells them, he gives them the faith example. He says, well, if you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a tree to climb into the sea. Now, of what use is that? It doesn't have any real use. And then he goes back to the story about the slave. It doesn't get rewarded for doing what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> and then we have the story of the ten lepers. So each time these stories seem to be disjointed and disconnected. So I'll try to connect them as, as I understand them and, and I think as the Lord intended them. So let's have a look a little bit at leprosy. Now leprosy in the Old Testament is more, it's a broader disease than what we understand today. Today we talk about leprosy, it's referred to, it means Hansen's disease. But in those days, any skin ailment or something that looked like leprosy would be classified with leprosy. And it would start with brownish red spots on your face and arms, and then sufferers would get sores, lose their skins, and eventually even their limbs, and they would get deformed. And many would die. It was seen as a curse from God and as his judgment. Albert Barnes states that a leper was a living parable in the world of sin, of which death is the wages. He was a picture of the corruption of sin. And this incident takes place in the Old Testament. Now, I know you're going to say, but hold on, Luke is in the New Testament. Yes, he is. But remember, Jesus hasn't died yet. So everything the people believe and do is still according to the Old Testament. 
So the context of this whole incident takes place in the, let's call it the Old Testament. And the people's understanding of leprosy and the practices can be found in Leviticus 13 and 14. And here we find the processes for, number one, identifying who is a leper, how to live like a leper, and then, of course, the how to be pronounced clean if, if your symptoms should disappear. Now, the priests were responsible for the first step and the last step. They would declare somebody to be leprous, and there was a whole procedure. And then if somebody recovered, they would return to the priests, and the priest would then pronounce them clean. Or cleansed and there would also be a whole procedure and even some offerings that were to be made. The middle bit however was left to the leper. The leper had to live like a leper and there were certain conditions that he had to abide by. First of all he had to tear his clothes. He had to loosen his hair and he wasn't allowed to cover his head. He had to cover his upper lip or moustache he had to walk around shouting, unclean, unclean. Now one of the features of leprosy is that your voice also disappears after a while. So it may be just a rasping noise of, uh, that you may hear from these people. <clears throat> and he had to live outside of the camp or the town. So if you think these days we've got social distancing or social, anti-social distancing, if you like, much, much worse. William Barclay says they were treated as dead men. Now our approach this morning is we're going to look at forgiveness as it cleanses a relationship so that the relationship, within the relationship, peace becomes a norm. There's many relationships that there's no war, but there isn't any peace either. Because there's just no peace. There's no harmony between the people in the relationship. So we have to look at the importance of forgiveness and we're going to have some thoughts about forgiveness. And uh, I have three points and then an, an object lesson. The first point is forgiveness is a command. We're just told to do it. Faith is required to accept forgiveness. And there's no reward for obeying our commands. And then we finish off with an object lesson of these ten lepers and we see how that relates to the rest of the story. So, forgiveness is a command. This is clear in the text in verse 3. Jesus says, forgive your brother. It's simple and straightforward. It's unambiguous. Faith is not required to forgive anybody. No amount of prayer or fasting or anything will help you. You just have to do it. It is the prerequisite for reconciliation. Without forgiveness, there can be no reconciliation. And unforgiveness is actually arrogance. It's when you forget that you also at fault sometimes, and that you also a human being, and that you have shortfalls. So, as Jesus says, just have to forgive your brother. Just let it go. Now, faith is required to accept forgiveness. It's not required to forgive. And this is where the apostles make a mistake. I want to mention that the apostles make a lot of mistakes in the Gospels, and we must be thankful for that, because every time they make a mistake, we get to learn from them. So they ask for more faith in order to forgive. Jesus corrects them. He shows them what faith can be used for, and it has nothing to do with forgiveness. However, the other side of the coin is, you cannot accept forgiveness without faith. In order to have faith, you must have humility. In order to have humility, you need to be aware of your unworthiness. Now, unworthiness is an object of truth. When a person has injured another person, it's the other people who see it first. The person who did the injuring is normally the last, and is normally defense about it, defensive about it about it. So humility is when you get to that point when you realize, when you see what other people see, and you realize that you've trespassed against somebody, you've injured somebody or you've hurt them, and you go about the process of accepting it. And this helps you achieve humility. 
To ask forgiveness, one is asking for mercy, which is not deserved. This obviously requires humility. Faith is required to accept forgiveness so that the relationship can proceed in peace and harmony. And let's get back to our text and my third point. There's no reward for obeying a command. So Jesus tells a story of a slave that should not expect a reward for obeying his master. His master. Likewise, we also don't receive a reward for forgiving anybody. When we forgive someone, we are just being obedient. There's nothing special in that. In this way, Jesus brings the apostles back to the issue of forgiveness. Because he doesn't lose sight of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is about reconciling. The reconciliation between us and God. So then the ten lepers arrive. And this is our object lesson. These are outcasts. They are not in a relationship with people. They are thrown out. They've been rejected. When they ask Jesus for healing, Jesus says, you go to the priest and show yourself. And as they go, they're healed. But one turns around. He doesn't go to a priest. I think he decided he didn't need a priest. Why do you say that, you might ask? Well, think about it this way. A priest is somebody who represents the people to God. So he's a representative of the people to God. The Samaritan has just realized that Jesus is God. Why does he need a representative if God is here? So he returns to praise, worship, to praise, worship, and thank Jesus, who understands to be God. The Samaritan has also returned to have his sins forgiven. How do you know that, you might ask? Well, because Jesus knows what he needs, and Jesus forgives his sins. He saves him. He makes him whole, and he says, your, your faith has made you well. The others have been healed, but they're not well. They don't have faith. He's living out what he just taught his disciples. He's forgiven a Samaritan, a foreigner. He's removed God's curse. So, to summarize, let's just go over it again. Forgiveness is a command. It is a requisite, a prerequisite for reconciliation and for your own forgiveness as well. So, you see how the kingdom of heaven will have no resentment in the kingdom because there will be much forgiveness. There will be proper peace and harmony. Faith is not required for forgiveness, but it is required to receive forgiveness. And humility is required to have faith. Jesus forgives everyone. He dies on the cross for everybody. So, he receives the forgiveness for us on our behalf. But we need to respond with humility and obedience to his commands. We receive his forgiveness by faith but we also forgive others because we're obedient to him. So forgive your brother. Let it go. Let's pray. Lord, when we pray for you to forgive us as we forgive, forgive others, it's not always true. Help us to understand your forgiveness and the importance of it in our lives, that we can apply it in our lives that it can impact our lives, that your word can grow, and that we can show fruit, and that we can look more and more like you every day. In the name of Jesus, amen. So for the benediction this morning, I've chosen Deuteronomy 33, verse 12. Thank you, Peter. And it's, of Benjamin he said, the beloved of the Lord will live safely by him. He protects him all the time and the Lord places him on his chest. Amen.